morning. Welcome, LA Progressive friends, family, readers, viewers. Um, the LA Progressive is really delighted that we are going to be sitting down, as a matter of fact, we are sitting down at this very moment with Lachey Henderson. And Lachey Henderson is a member of the Defenders of Justice for Superior Court. He's running for seat number 97 on the Los Angeles County Superior Court. And I just want to say, hey, Lachey, hey, tell us about yourself. How are you? I'm doing great and it's such a pleasure to be here with you. And um, you know, I was a public defender for 18 years and I worked in misdemeanors, juvenile court, felony court. I've done civil contempts. I've also done racial justice litigation. So I have a wide range of experience. Uh, just this past fall, I worked as an adjunct professor at Pepperdine, and I really enjoyed the experience working with students. So it's just such a wonderful opportunity to be able to meet voters and, and talk about my experience as a public defender. Thank you, Lachey. You know, it's so exciting to me because as a resident of Los Angeles County now for more than 40 years, I, was, I wasn't born here. I was born in New York. But as a resident, and as a voting, very um, civically engaged resident, I just found it so daunting every time we would have a judicial election to have to you know, open up my ballot and select someone who I knew virtually nothing about. And I was so surprised to find out that the Los Angeles Superior Court had never had a public defender elected as a judge until um, Holly Hancock. So we just have this one and everyone else is either appointed by um, governor or it's an election as the former prosecutors. And it's, it's no wonder that we have the outcomes that we continue to have. So it's exciting. So tell us, so you um, have been a public defender for did you say 18? 18 years. Amazing, amazing. So tell us, you know, as you uh, are, look at these ca the cases that you looked at for 18 years, seeing them through the lens of a, pub of a public defender as, a, as opposed to a prosecutor, it's a very different experience. Yes, <laughs> definitely. And so, so I- go ahead. go ahead. So I just wanted to say, you know, when you look at these cases, there's been so many times when you walk out of the court just saying something is going wrong and you feel this heaviness in your soul when you look at what happens on certain cases where there's no compassion given or the judicial officer misses some nuances or some special things about your client that really would have made a difference on a case. And when you start to see those trends, you begin to see, okay, we need uh, judicial officers with more perspective and with from diverse backgrounds because it changes how you evaluate. Yeah, yeah. You know, I um, I went to law school. I was a law professor. I was president of People's College of Law, and I'm always learning more. So currently, uh, my husband and I are auditing a class by Professor Jody Armour, and every Wednesday night we sit with Jody Armour and law school students. So. Um, he was last week, he was talking about how when law students come to study the law, they're oftentimes they're looking to learn about justice. And really, when you go to law school, you don't really learn about justice. You learn about the black letter law. Right. And I think that unless you bring a certain lens, a certain experience to the bench, there's so much that you can miss if your rulings are simply based on the black letter law. Correct. And you know, there's all types of prosecutors. You have some that are open to learning and then some that are are conditioned to be more political. They're looking to, you know, move forward and so they have a different lens. They want to get convictions or they feel motivated to do that. And so when you're coming out of that lens, you're not necessarily evaluating to see what's appropriate. You're looking to see what outcome you want. You know, this is going to look good for my office. This is going to look good for me. And when you're coming out of that lens, it taints and it creates a bias in how you look at things. So that's interesting. You know, we often hear how the um, prosecutors, you know, they they try to accumulate all of these uh, wins 
because it helps them in their careers. But the op you don't hear about the opposite on the public defender side. You don't hear how the wins somehow help you with your career. So I thank you for, for bringing that point in. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the vast majority of people currently today that are sitting in LA County jails and how um, approximately 44% of them are legally innocent because they are there for pre-trial. And the um, LA uh, defenders, the law defensive fights against pre-trial incarceration. Can you talk about why um, you support the idea of fighting pre-trial incarceration? Well, it's devastating to members of the community to be in custody all the way to your trial. Let's say you have a misdemeanor, a domestic violence case, you're fighting it, there's evidence that your lawyer has to investigate. So you're sitting in custody, uh, losing benefits, losing time at work. And then when you get out, you're devastated. And we don't wanna create a system where when you come out, you've lost everything. We want people to be able to maintain their jobs and maintain their lives. And there's so many things you can do to promote public safety. You can order the person to do AA meetings while they're waiting for pretrial. You can order them to do classes or to do something in the community that will facilitate them learning as they're waiting for trial. So it's so important that people are able to maintain their life because it prevents recidivism. If you go back out into the community and you have nothing, you go back to your old life. You go back to what you know. But if we allow people to rebuild and still have their life as this is going on, they can maintain and then move forward. Yeah, yeah. It's a, okay, before we move on to talking about all of the, the different areas of the law that as a judge you would be responsible for, Let's talk a little bit about your beginnings. Where'd you come from? Well, I grew up in South Central Los Angeles. Um, I went to high school at Hamilton High School. I loved it there. I loved to sing. I write poetry. So it was a wonderful place to learn. And then I went to Cal State Fullerton, which is local to me here in Diamond Bar. And then I went to Pepperdine for school. And so I ended up, I thought I wanted to be a DA that I was in law school, I experienced a lot of loss. My mother passed my first year. So I was commuting back and forth from Malibu to Diamond Bar to take care of my family. And after I graduated, my father passed. So I ended up shifting into becoming a guardian at 22. And my home was, they came to my home to see how I was taking care of my siblings and decided to make me a guardian. So while I'm studying for the bar, I'm taking care of my siblings and, you know, having to go to court. And I remember going to court for my brother and I was advocating for my brother to get uh, mental health services because we had lost our parents. And the public defender there at the time was Rita Smith. She said, you know what? I think you should be a public defender. You've got the heart for it. And so that's what motivated me to apply. And that's how I ended up working in the public defender's office. And I enjoyed uh, being a public defender and fighting for people, you know, but there's another side that you see. You see the cross-cultural disconnect. You see prejudice towards uh, Black defendants, Latine defendants, and also sometimes towards me as a Black woman. And so when you start to see those trends, it, it weighs heavy on you. And that's why I want to be a part of changing uh, that fabric and changing it into you walk into my courtroom and it's an experience and it's, it's an experience of justice where everyone is heard, where everyone is listened to. It's an opportunity to have a conversation where evidence is offered. And I haven't made a decision until I have heard the evidence instead of deciding which way I'll lean before I've heard anything. That's amazing. And, and and then speaking about your brother, um, talk a little bit about your work um, in private practice, um, teaching juvenile rights and so on. Oh, yes. So it's been so rewarding. Um, in the fall, I taught juvenile rights and juvenile rights is really fascinating because you've got the dependency part of it, which deals with if parents are neg negligent. So you're looking at the law in that regard. And then when you're looking at delinquency, it's two part. It is the actual criminal law and then the mitigation portion where you're getting experts. You're looking at 
uh, programs for juveniles. You're coaching, you're mentoring in the hallway. You know, a lot of public defenders, you'll see them in the hallway talking to the kids, talking to the parents, getting programs. So it was wonderful to be able to talk about that in the law school context. The students were so excited to hear about what goes on in court. And I really wanted to encourage them that you have a call on your life. You have a passion to pursue that passion. And they received it with so much joy. The papers they wrote were amazing. Um, the other thing that I've been able to do is work with my local church, a greater good news. They want to expand classes for people that want their record expunged. And so we want to plan to do some classes at the church and really help people get back on track with their lives. So it sounds like what you are supportive of is a restorative type of justice. Instead of retribution, retaliation, and revenge, you seem to be more interested in redemption, rehabilitation, restoration. And Absolutely. Just, I mean, when we think about the recidivism rate in the state of California, you really can't deny that we need restorative justice. We just cannot continue to age people. Yes, and I agree. Uh, restorative justice can take on so many forms. You know, it's like I said, at pretrial, assigning classes to the person while they're um, coming to court for a DUI, or it could be in court encouraging the person like this is only one part of your life. You can turn it around. Like I'm not looking at you like you're discarded or you're no longer useful. This is one season of your life. And if we can help you get back on track, let's do that. And how can I facilitate that? And if you see that the judge cares, it changes the dynamic. I remember representing a gentleman. Um, he was charged with several uh, theft cases as a felony. And we really didn't have a strong case. He was on video taking um, the items, but he didn't want to accept an offer because he didn't feel safe to. And so he was just like, Ms. Henderson, I, I don't want to accept an offer. So we were continuing the matter to try to make sure we got a good deal. Well, we came out in court and the judge that day recognized him. And she was so nice to him. She talked to him and said, I remember you. And you could see his walls coming down that he felt safe, like, okay, this judge cares. This judge is going to try to work with us. And so she looked at his credits and and made an offer that was reasonable. And I went and talked to him and he said, okay, I'm ready to accept the offer. So it made a difference. That judge made a difference to him because he felt like, okay, this judge is actually being fair towards me. And That's because wonderful. He, yes. And in that case, the prosecutor was being more harsh. So I think he just was very guarded. So that was an example to me of how you can facilitate from the bench and make someone feel comfortable in a courtroom. Yeah, yeah. You know, we often hear um, for those who are who who are tough on crime, they use that's their mantra. The excuse that they use for being tough on crime is public safety. But from my perspective, that tough on crime actually creates unsafe environments in the communities of people of color. So when someone has been handled harshly, when they've used retaliation and retribution, when that person gets out, there's a high percentage that return um, through recidivism because they can't find employment. They are returned to a family. They are returned to a community and they're damaged as, as a result of experiencing what they've experienced. So it's why it's so important to me personally now we have people on the bench like you who understand the importance of fairness, who understand the importance of dealing with individuals, prioritizing justice and equality for all of the people that come before the bench. Is there anything else that you want to share with, you know, you and I had uh, met briefly and we talked and when you were just sharing with me that your, your mother and father passed away within a short span of time and that you were in law school and then you became, um, you had to raise your sisters and brothers. It just amazes me that you even got through law school. Yes. And you know, it, it really showed me how uh, mental health services are so important. My brother was getting in trouble. He was fighting, but really he missed our parents. And so I think it's important to understand people's journey, you know, and public defenders, we tell a story. 
that people come with backgrounds, they come with history. And if we ignore that history and just say, I'm gonna punish you and not listen to the whole story, we're not really making a quality decision. And I have been in courts where I filed my motion. I haven't even spoke yet. And the judge is saying, deny, like forming their lips to say deny. And I'm like, well, this is not fair. You haven't even heard what I have to say. You don't know what we're going to present. So that's not a fair setting. If you've already made up your mind, you're going to decide the other way. So we really have to court, each court has to be focused on making sure that that evidence is heard, that we're making quality decisions, and that people's lives matter. And I was thinking about when you were talking, just examples of cases where I felt like, you know, the judge was harsh or didn't really listen or decided they didn't like my client. And so the whole case kind of had this slant of negativity. And it's like, you haven't heard anything yet. Why are we already thinking destructively about this person? And the clients feel it and the families feel it when they come in. So there, there's changes that need to be made. And there's an opportunity to really heal our communities. And if people feel like they had a fair trial, it makes a difference. If the clients walk away feeling like, hey, nobody was listening to me. Um, this this whole thing was a circus. You know, they lose respect for the system. They lose respect. And that's how they operate in society. Like nobody mm -hmm. cares. I'm not a part of this community. No one even heard what I had to say. And we don't want people to feel that way when they come to court. Well, that's wonderful. So Lachey Henderson, you are running for Los Angeles Superior Court seat number 97. And we encourage people um, election for the, pri it's this primary election. The election day is March the 5th, but you can vote before March the 5th. Is that, is that right? Yes. You can do the mail-in ballots. Um, I know some people vote ahead of time. I usually wait till March 5th, but yeah, you can start voting on February 5th. Wonderful. Well, with Jay Henderson, it's been a pleasure talking with you. I look forward to seeing what happens in the near future for you and, and we're rooting for you. The Defenders of Justice for the Superior Court is a wonderful organization and they do a great job vetting. The LA Progressive works with the Defenders of Justice to share this information with our viewers and our readers. So thank you again, Lachey Henderson and best of luck to you. Thank you for having me. So long. Thank you for sticking around. If you like the LA Progressive content and the discussions we have here, please consider clicking the subscribe button below and also give us a thumbs up. That helps to grow our audience by feeding the algorithm, which helps to get this content in front of more eyes. Thanks for stopping by. We really appreciate your support.